Hello and welcome to our service on the first Sunday after Trinity. I hope that everyone has had a good week. I know that some of you have taken advantage of the school break to visit family or friends, whilst others have been pottering in the garden. Whatever you have been doing, I hope that you have been enjoying this long-awaited sunshine. So let us bring ourselves before the Lord, our Saviour. Lord, we are your people, called by your name. Together we place our trust in you and bring our lives to you. Our hopes and our joys, our worries and our fears. For we know that we are safely held in the circle of your love. Amen. In today's reading, we encounter Jesus' family, but I will leave Paul to delve into that later. Family, though, has probably been on our minds this year, as we have not been able to see them as much as we would like. But sometimes, family may not be as we term blood. But it could be a place where we feel safe and where we can just be ourselves. On this day in 1844, a man named George Williams, along with 11 friends, set up a refuge of Bible study and prayer for young men seeking escape from the hazards of life on the streets of London. It provided them with a family. This family is now present in 120 countries and has been immortalised by a certain song by the village people, the YMCA. They now offer support and advice to children, young people and parents, not just young men. And I would like to think that we consider ourselves to be part of a family, the church family, where we can offer each other mutual support, friendship and help when we need it. Jesus said, before you offer your gift, go and be reconciled. As sisters and brothers in God's family, we come together to ask our Father for forgiveness. You made us to be one family, yet we have divided humanity. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. You were born a Jew to reconcile all people, yet we have brought disharmony amongst races. Christ have mercy, Christ have mercy. You rejoice in our differences, yet we make them a cause of enmity. Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy. May the God of love and power forgive us and free us from our sins, heal and strengthen us by his spirit and raise us to new life in Christ our Lord. Amen.
This week's New Testament reading is from Mark, chapter 3. And the crowd came together again, so that they could not even eat. When his family heard it, they went out to restrain him. For people were saying, he has gone out of his mind. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, he has Beelzebul. And by the ruler of the demons, he casts out demons. And he called them to him and spoke to them in parables. How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand. But his end has come. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his property without first tying up the strong man. Then indeed the house can be plundered. Truly, I tell you, people will be forgiven for their sins and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit can never have forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin, for they said he has an unclean spirit. Then his mother and his brothers came, and standing outside they sent to him and called him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, Your mothers and your brothers and sisters are outside asking for you. And he replied, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking at those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. And the crowd came together again, so that they couldn't even eat. Jesus, at the end of another long, exhausting day, heading back to the house in Capernaum he's using as a base, and yet still completely mobbed by the crowd. So much so that he can't even manage to grab a bite to eat in peace. Can you imagine what that would be like, especially for somebody who needed regular time away, alone, to pray and to rest? For me, that's the stuff of nightmares. Even though we've only reached the third chapter of Mark, Jesus' ministry is growing rapidly as he moved about Galilee, teaching, healing and exercising evil spirits. And the crowd were flocking to see this amazing new teacher who taught with authority and performed miracles. Word was spreading far and wide. It had already reached back to his family in Nazareth, 20 miles away, and not in a good way. Rumour had it that he'd lost his mind, or he was possessed, and so worried were they that they set out immediately on the long road trip to restrain him. Mark's language here is quite deliberate. This wasn't just Mary going to Capernaum to have a word. She'd taken Jesus' brothers with her. Make no mistake, this was a rescue mission maybe even a press gang. Tough love, all for his own good, obviously. All the usual phrases. Word had reached other ears as well, though. In amongst the crowds there were scribes, accusing him of being in league with Satan. Not that unusual, on the face of it. But notice, these weren't the local teachers. These were the Jerusalem scribes. Mark is very clear about that. These were the heavy hitters, the top of the heap. Jerusalem was 80 miles away. It's a four-day hike. And even today, it's a two-and-a-half-hour drive, depending on which way you go. So they weren't there by accident. Mark has lots to say about Jesus' words to the scribes, but that's another sermon for another time. Briefly, he just turned their words back at them and said that if he had been casting out demons in the name of the devil, that would be a civil war. And that anyway, he'd already beaten the devil tying up the strong man before plundering his house. 
which may have been a reference to his temptation in the wilderness by Satan. He did give his critics a stern warning, though, that blasphemy against the Holy Spirit was the one unforgivable sin. Wherever he went, Jesus polarised people. You couldn't be neutral. In the middle were the crowds looking for miracles, for healing or just for food. And then at one extreme, there were those who accused him of being in league with the devil. And at the other end of the scale, his own family, who thought he was either possessed or insane. Try to imagine being stuck in the middle of that. Think about all of that bearing down upon you for a moment. And then we come to the most difficult verses in the passage, perhaps in the whole of Mark's Gospel. Jesus' family have now arrived at the house, Mary and his brothers hot foot, literally, from Nazareth. They've come to fetch him, to take him home. And they're outside knocking. Actually, they're probably pounding on the door. But when Jesus is told, your mother and your brothers are outside asking for you, he says, who are my mother and my brothers? And then looking around him, here are my mothers and my brothers. Well, the crowd had probably expected him to say something like bring them in, make them welcome. And I'm absolutely certain that's exactly what Mary and her sons were expecting. But of course he didn't. Instead, to the shock and amazement of those gathered round, he said, Whoever does God's will is my brother, my sister, my mother. Jesus, as always, turning things upside down. So what was so shocking about what he'd said? Family in the Jewish tradition was everything. It was at the heart of their culture, both in faith and in everyday life. The two were inseparable. More, Jewish society was matriarchal. So the essential Jewishness was handed down through the women, not the men. And Jewish women ruled their households. So for Jesus to have apparently disrespected his mother Mary in this way would have been unthinkable. Even now in our very different culture, it still seems pretty shocking. And I'd certainly think twice before saying something like that. Certainly if I was still in range. Some suggest that Jesus had form for being rude to Mary, pointing to the wedding incident at Cana, when she came to him and told him that the wine had run out. Clearly she was expecting him to fix it. And he'd said to her, Woman, why are you bothering me with this? My time has not yet come. But that's a misunderstanding of language and culture. It comes for looking at the event through a Western 21st century prism. What's more, Jesus was a very definitely a devout Jew, so such behaviour would be unthinkable. Remember too that in John's account of the crucifixion, virtually the very last thing Jesus did as he hung on the cross was to make sure that Mary was taken care of. John says when Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. And then he said to the disciple, here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. So what was really going on? Well, instead, Jesus points to all of those around him, the sick, the lame, the poor, all those who had flocked to him here in Capernaum, looking for food, for healing, for an end to suffering, perhaps for a revolution, for a messiah. Jesus was rewriting what it means to be family. No longer just blood relationships, but for all those new followers, they had become part of something much larger. United in belief and fellowship, they were becoming church. Church, sometimes called the Bride of Christ. This is church's family. And this was absolutely not about snubbing his immediate family, excluding them. Actually, it was quite the opposite. This was about inclusion, not exclusion. It was something so much bigger. All of these people he called family, regardless of colour, gender, health, wealth, status or occupation. Though we don't know very much about the crowd, at the very least we know that there would have been men and women, free and enslaved, rich and poor. 
Amongst them there were fishermen, carpenters, traders, tax collectors, farmers, soldiers and religious leaders. The whole cross-section were there. All of these people now called together as Jesus' family. As ever, though, this was about choice too. Jesus called them all family, willing to embrace them all, but there was a choice to be made, and not all wanted to be part of this family. Certainly not a family as they understood it. Instead, those with the power and the privilege, his accusers, by their words and their actions, chose to exclude themselves. As we sit here today, though, we're a lot like those early followers ringed around Jesus' feet, listening. Whatever our personal circumstances, whether we've come from big families or perhaps live alone, from whichever church building we align ourselves to or village we live in, we come together to be part of something much, much larger, our benefits, our church family, which in turn is part of the amazing family of God, part of the kingdom with all its blessings. Like all families, there can be issues from time to time, as we all know. None of us are perfect or can ever hope to measure up. But with God's grace, we can work through those things. And together as family, we are so much bigger, better and stronger. Covid has taught or perhaps just reminded us of that. Equally, problems faced together as family suddenly seem so much smaller, so much more manageable. So today I invite us all to give thanks to God that we are part of his family, not by birth, not by right, not by privilege or status, but simply by his invitation. And it doesn't get any better than that, does it? Amen. Heavenly Father, we pray for our clergy and ministry teams. May they receive your wisdom and guidance moving forward according to your will to give everyone a place to belong. Loving Father, we pray for our communities in Welton, Dunholm and Scotland that those in need will be provided for, those who are suffering will know your healing power and peace in their lives. Father God, we remember this day on the 77th anniversary of the D-Day landings in Normandy, those who gave the ultimate sacrifice to bring an end to the war in Europe, that we may live in peace and freedom from tyranny. We pray that where there is conflict in nations across our world, that this will cease so that all peoples may live in lasting peace. Gracious Father, we thank you for all the NHS staff and volunteers who have been manning the vaccination centres across our nation. We pray that every eligible person will ensure that they will go and receive the two vaccinations so that we as a nation can fight against the coronavirus and that everyone will be responsible in respecting the need to be safe at all times. Father God, we pray for our government and the public health advisers will come together to and make wise decisions as they consider the removal of the COVID-19 restrictions over the next two weeks. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. The Collect for Today God of Truth, help us to keep your law of love and to walk in ways of wisdom that we may find true life in Jesus Christ your Son. Amen. We say together the Benefice Prayer Ever-living, ever-loving God we thank you for our church family 
and your world that we serve. Grant that we may honour you in our prayer and praise. Share the good news of your love and build up all through loving service. Help us to give everyone a place to belong and a way to follow Jesus. Amen. As our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and for ever. Amen. Thank you for joining us today as a family in Christ, and we look forward to seeing you again next week. Let us pray. Great God, you are one God, and you bring together what is scattered and mend what is broken. Unite us with the scattered peoples of the earth that we may be one family of your children. Bind up all our wounds and heal us in spirit, that we may be renewed as disciples of Jesus Christ, our Master and Saviour. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen.
got above all open my eyes to your lips show me your face open my